The Sustainability Now Telesummit is honored to share audacious ideas and innovative solutions from more than 30 experts from around the globe. Learn how we can work together to shape a world that works. Here's your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome back to the Sustainability Now Telesummit, shaping a world that works. It is such a privilege to introduce to you Hazel Henderson, founder of Ethical Markets Media, a certified B Corporation, and the Ethical Markets TV series. Hazel is a world-renowned futurist, evolutionary economist, worldwide syndicated columnist, consultant on sustainable development, and author of nine books, including Ethical Markets, Growing the Green Economy, which won the Axiom and Nautilus Awards. Her editorials and articles appear in 27 languages, 200 newspapers, and over 250 journals. Hazel leads the Transforming Finance Initiative, created the Green Transition Scoreboard, and is an active member of the National Press Club, the World Future Society, an honorary member of the Club of Rome, and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and fellow of Britain's Royal Society for the Arts. In 2013, she was inducted into the International Society of Sustainability Professionals Hall of Fame. Hazel, what a privilege to have you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So you, you're an economist and a futurist. I mean, you spot trends globally, and of course, you're an environmentalist. So I, uh, it's really a privilege to have you be able to give a broad perspective on emerging markets and opportunities and solutions. And um, I, I, we were going to spend time today talking about halophyte plants and saltwater agriculture. And I, I'm just intrigued as to how that came on your radar uh, before we get into your presentation. Well, basically for the past 10 years, we have put out this annual Green Transition Scoreboard, uh, which has been tracking private investments in green sectors around the world, uh, mostly really uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency and all of those technologies that are succeeding beyond the fossil fuel era. And what we have found now, after tracking this for 10 years, we started off uh, finding 1.2 trillion of private investment back in 2009. And uh, we released that uh, for the UN Summit on Climate, which was in 2009 at uh, Copenhagen. And it was kind of a train wreck. There were all these bureaucrats, and they were all naming and shaming and blaming each other, you know. And uh, what they were leaving on the table is what everybody agreed about, and that is that we have to shift to beyond fossil fuels to renewable energy economies. And we seem to be the only people who were actually tracking the private investment. Forget about governments, the private sector was going ahead. And That's so a, that, I just want to stop you for a second because that in and of itself is a profoundly hopeful statement. And you see, what happened was over the succeeding 10 years, we've been doing this for 10 years now, every year we found another uh, trillion dollars worth of new investments. And so by 2018, uh, we realized that um, we could go beyond looking at green energy. Uh, because now Bloomberg New Energy Finance and S&P and there were all of these portfolios. So they didn't need us to be covering that anymore. And so we looked at the next challenge because what I'm always trying to do is to look further down the road and figure out what no one's paying attention to yet. And then I noticed, my gosh, it is the global food 
crisis. And uh, the, what I realized was that the entire human food supply is teetering very perilously on the planet's 3% of, of fresh water. And meanwhile, 97% of salt water, we have thousands of food plants that thrive on salt water. And they are eaten in 22 countries around the world uh, from time immemorial. And that it seemed to me that our next job would be to focus on this and figure out which one of these salt-loving plants are called halophytes, that means hallow, salt, fight, love, um, which one of them or group of them could expand very rapidly into the global food supply. And the amazing thing about these plants is that they can be grown on all kinds of degraded and desert land that we weren't using. And they don't need fertilizers, they don't need pesticides, and basically they have these very deep roots which allow them to capture carbon, carbon dioxide that's already in the air, and store it in the soil, which is what nature always has done. So uh, we wrote this report, and it's called Capturing CO2 While Improving Human Nutrition and Health. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and then we found we produced that about a year ago uh, in April of 2018. And since then, the whole thing has exploded. The whole field of plant-based proteins like Beyond Meat, our friend Wayne Silby, who was an investor in Beyond Meat, uh, they just did an IPO. And the first day, its price tripled. And there are now about 20 of these startup companies using plants that we've never used before in order to expand the global food supply. So that's why we shifted our attention uh, to uh, food. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. You're talking about Beyond Meat, and there's another company called Impossible Meat. And right. it was just very recently that uh, Burger King announced that they are going to be providing vegan yes. burgers That's that, right. uh, that are indistinguishable from traditional burgers in taste. For many right. People. And they're already in, in thousands of restaurants around the world. They are now coming to Burger King. And here's the interesting thing. The report that I'm working on right now with my partner, Larray, Larray Long, uh, we're putting together the very next one of our Green Transition Scoreboard. And we suddenly realized that our financial markets, the mainstream financial markets, are so way behind understanding all this new science new science of food uh, made in laboratories from stem cells, all of this kind of thing. And so we realized that the next great risk in the financial sector is science denial. Oh, interesting. And we have in our Congress in the U.S. right now, uh, we have denial of the science of climate change. We have about... We have, I think the last time anyone did a survey on this, a 30 to 40 percent of U.S. adults deny the science of evolution. And so we are falling way, way behind. Uh, and, uh, and so our new report is called Transitioning to Science-Based Investing. Oh, interesting. We can't have any more of this formulas coming out of the heads of economists and old textbooks about interest rate risk and market risk. Hey, the real risk is we don't understand what's going on in the real world. And if you, we keep on denying scientific evidence, um, this is the biggest new financial risk. So this is why we wanted to bring this to the attention of the global financial community. So by 
bringing awareness of that, do you think that you're going to get greater engagement in scientific data? Do you think you'll Hopefully. Get this whole report um, uh, uh, is not just for nerds, but the whole report uh, brings up to date all of the science, what we call Earth system science. Like that uh, view behind your image right now uh, is understanding how the biosphere works. And, um, you know, we just have published the report of this UN uh, group uh, on biodiversity that, you know, that the species are going extinct now because of human activities tearing up forests and all of that um, at, at a rate that never has happened before. Astronomical. And, yes, exactly. And so uh, this is the kind of science that we have to now uh, bring into financial models. And most of the algorithms that financial advisors and portfolio managers, particularly of big pension funds, use are so out of date and they have no idea what's in that algorithm. They're just pushing the buttons. And so we've been trying to connect with them for many years and saying, look, you know, you have to unpack that algo that you're using to drive this gigantic portfolio of $200 billion of pension fund assets, um, you have to unpack it, find out what the assumptions are. And, you know, a lot of the assumptions in there um, are like they're carrying on their books all these fossil fuel reserves as if they're going to be lifted up and burned. But we can't do that anymore without cooking the planet. So we're saying, hey, why don't you recategorize those fuels as fuel? Don't We're not going to burn them. They're far too valuable for burning. Uh, instead, why don't you recategorize them as feedstock to be kept in the ground and used maybe many, many years ahead of, uh, of now um, for pharmaceuticals, for plastics, for whatever. But for heaven's sakes, um, if you don't change that algorithm, you're going to have to write them off. And they call it stranded assets. So we're saying this is a way to do a win-win with all of the climate community. We don't want to burn them, so keep them in the ground and just change your algorithm. It's like a stroke of the pen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or a click of the mouse. Mm -hmm. That's actually yes. crazy. Yes, it is. It really is. It's like um, what uh, a lot of the cognitive psychologists, people like Daniel Kahneman, um, who the economists gave one of their phony Nobel Prizes to. It's not really a Nobel Prize. It is called the Bank of Sweden Prize. But anyway, um, they Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, talks about these various cognitive biases that we're learning about ourselves. I've just written an article about this, actually. And um, he calls this particular kind of thing that we're dealing with with the financial community – he calls it theory-induced blindness. And they've got all these formulas in their heads, ETFs, indexes, um, theme uh, investing, uh, all of this kind of passive stuff, you know, we just push the button. And um, this is theory-induced blindness. And so what we're trying to do is wake them up. Yes. You know, say so you have to wake up to a whole lot of new stuff uh, that you're going to have to learn. You learn stuff at the Harvard Business School, which is now obsolete. Yeah. Yeah. Well, And the thing is that the change is so accelerated right now. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, I think I, I think it is truly revolutionary, truly world shaking that. Burger King is is uh, selling vegan burgers. Impossible, yeah, impossible meat, impossible burgers. Yeah, what do they call it? Impossible it's, meat. It's impossible food. Impossible meat is the company, yeah. and impossible oh, impossible meat. foods. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, just to go back to the science thing 
about science denial. See, these new startup companies in the plant-based food sector, uh, not just food, but beverages, soy milk, almond milk, you know, you know, all that stuff. They themselves are scientists. See, the guy who started Impossible Foods is a PhD, former professor at uh, UC. I think, I can't remember which part of the University of California. But he's also a licensed doctor, an MD. And the reason he started, his name is Pat Brown, and the reason he started Impossible Foods is that he had been trying for a decade to get people to pay attention to what I'm talking about, the food crisis, uh, that we're, A, destroying the planet with the way we're producing our food and ruining our health. Right. with too much meat and antibiotics and all that stuff. And finally, when he realized that he was not getting any kind of traction, he said, okay, I'm going to start a company. And so that was why he started Impossible Foods. Well, I think, I think that there's some debate as to the healthfulness of the, of the product, um, but... I guess it's all relative, you know, perhaps it's healthier than meat. It's certainly healthier for the environment. Um, I, you know, I think that's yet to be seen, but. Well, it's had a pretty good um, analysis. And the only thing um, I think that we need to remember um, is that all of these um, alternative meats uh, probably um, you want to watch how much salt they have in them um, and fat. how much satur saturated fat. Yeah. But, um, but in uh, uh, Impossible Foods Burgers, I just read a report, a health report from a scientific journal, and they say it's a good choice for mm -hmm. vegans and vegetarians because it, um, it provides them with a lot of uh, very essential miner minerals and vitamins that they normally don't get um, in a totally plant-based uh, or, or maybe that's short of if they don't eat all of the, if they don't eat enough nuts and, you know, you have to be very careful. Like I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. Yeah. And um, it just suits my body better, I guess. But um, I'm very careful um, about eating uh, lots and lots of fresh, organically grown vegetables and fruits and lots of nuts and uh, legumes. And, you know, so you have to pay attention uh, to get all the right stuff. But... Um, you know, it's all it's all delicious, and I prefer it. You know, it's so interesting uh, that what I understand is that the primary market for Impossible Foods burgers and um, Beyond Meat and is is meat eaters. Yes, yeah. See, I wouldn't eat that because I don't like the look of burgers. Uh, I wouldn't eat that anyway, you know. I think that's but, true for a lot of vegetarians. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the the interesting thing also, what we found in our report last year, um, is how much money um, from animal rights people like me and vegetarians and vegans all over the world, how much investment they are willing to put into these new companies. I mean, can you imagine this group that we found based in Britain called FAIR, F-A-I-R-R? Guess they have 11 trillion wow. of assets under management. There's a consortium, it's a worldwide consortium, including sovereign wealth funds in Asia. Because see, a lot of Asians have always been vegetarians. And the big challenge now um, is to make sure that Asians stay healthy on their traditional vegetarian diets and don't get caught up in our fashion for eating too much meat where they can end up, uh, you know, with antibiotics and all kinds of bad stuff, which comes along with meat diets. 
So, you know, The Lancet, uh, the, which is the uh, group in Britain that puts out that journal, uh, they brought out a report um, from about 50 doctors uh, saying that uh, it's for, uh, for, for better health worldwide, uh, people should, uh, particularly Western uh, people, uh, should cut meat consumption by at least 50 percent for their health. Right. And and it's also one of the number one ways that we can help the planet is by reducing yes. meat consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Because it can it contributes the whole uh, managing, cutting down forests and uh, using land for raising cattle and uh, all of the other uh, livestock. Yeah, it uses water, and uh, all, there's all of the acreage to grow their feed, the, yeah. the alfalfa and corn and all the rest of it. So that sector of livestock-raised meats is now just about 15% of all the greenhouse gases, which we're trying to keep uh, reducing. Right. So, all, I mean, is this not a win-win-win? going to be yeah, healthy I mean, if the, and clean up the planet? Right. So if the reason to eat meat is because you like the taste of it, you like the texture of it, here are alternatives that preserve that exactly. experience. Yeah. Exactly, yes. yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you're going to tell us about halophyte plants. How about if we jump into your presentation and we can chat um, as, you're, as you're presenting? Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so uh, basically greening the global food system, my favorite subject. And so as I mentioned in our conversation, uh, basically 97% of the water on this planet is salty and only 3% of it is fresh. And so I produced this book a, a few years ago and the foreword was by uh, NASA chief scientist, Dennis Bushnell, who became a good friend and we've done six TV shows with him about the future of the internet, the future of energy, uh, the future of robots and uh, so on and so on. But we also did one on investing in saltwater agriculture because I found out to my delight um, that he was also as interested in halophyte salt-loving plants as me um, as the quickest way to expand the global food supply and make it healthier. So that's why we want to redesign the global food system, because it's unsustainable and, of course, dependent on that 3% of the planet's fresh water. And it relies on those monoculture crops, which are in the commodity markets, wheat, rice, soy, alfalfa and corn. And as we were saying, meat from livestock is 15% of the greenhouse gases. And also, of course, that these uh, kind of diets are bad for human health. And yet, uh, we found that all these global agencies, the UN, the FAO, the business groups, and all the rest of it, were doing all of this research and talking about the water crisis, the water crisis. And of course, the, the, what they meant was the fresh water crisis. And they were looking at the dwindling agricultural land and how the population is growing. And uh, okay, all all of this is very important. We have to reduce water pollution from pesticides and so on and so forth. So a lot of investments around the world has been going into this quote unquote water crisis, all focused on this 3% of fresh water, all perfectly good scientific investments to make our use of fresh water more efficient, you know, better irrigation, sewage, pipes, and desalination. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And, you know, composting toilets, all of the things that you could do. But they've ignored all the opportunities that we found um, in all of these unused plants, not only the salt loving plants, but all of the natural wild plants that can be packaged and marketed like uh, jackfruit and acai in Brazil. And now, of course, we began to really focus on all these startup 
companies, and we're deeply into expanding that with our upcoming report. And as I mentioned um, last time uh, in our last report, uh, these investments um, and uh, these people who are, tend to be animal rights uh, animal lovers, vegans, vegetarians, e environmentalists, they have 11 trillion of assets under management that they can throw into this game of investing in these new companies, and they actually short the stocks of the 16 largest meat producing and mm. using companies. So they've got, you know, to both sides of this. And then uh, uh, the, the uh, Lancet report, um, which shows that this is better health uh, to cut down. They talk about cutting down 50% uh, of Western diets, um, reducing the, the meat for health reasons. So uh, I, when I did an update of this last year, I had to quote the, the new CEO of Tyson Foods. He says, meat is the new tobacco. Wow. And basically, since then, he invested $55 million into Beyond Meat. And Tyson has set up its own venture capital firm now called Tyson New Ventures, uh, which is looking at all of the new protein foods and beverages. So this is the uh, how this is accelerating. And uh, as you know, the reason for all the acceleration is this report of the IPCC. That's the, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change uh, and their report last October uh, just shocked everybody where they say really we have 10 to 12 years now to turn this around and we can do it we have all the technology to do it it's all about political will You're not kidding. And, and and facing down the climate deniers and the science deniers wherever they are and so this is how uh, we realized that salt-loving plants were actually the lowest hanging fruit because not only are they thriving on salt water and growing on these degraded and desert lands, 40% of the unused land on this planet, they need no pesticides or fertilizers. Many of them grow wild. The one we're most familiar with in the West is uh, quinoa, and that is the grain which is a total uh, protein. Uh, I, I use, I eat a lot of it. It's delicious. You can use it for breakfast, you know, instead of oatmeal, uh, but it's also great on salads and all kinds of things. And then there's also China's salt-tolerant rice, which pretty much grows on the beaches mm -hmm. in southern China and commands a very high price because it's so delicious. And salicornia is a, um, a vegetable um, which you can find in lots of salads. Uh, there are restaurants restaurants in Amsterdam uh, to have salicornia and salads. And yet all of this, um, until very, very recently, was ignored by investors. So that's why um, we decided, you know, to make a big push to get people to understand um, that, hey, we can do this uh, within this 10-year uh, framework, you know, and this is what these plants look like. And this is why they are so valuable right now. They have these very deep roots, which uh, uh, segregate the salt. So you don't end up with lots and lots of salt in the uh, uh, leaves. And uh, But uh, they also capture all of this CO2 and stabilize it in the soil, which is the way nature does things. And so that's why my friend Dennis Bushnell, our NASA chief scientist, we did this uh, uh, video, which uh, you can look at at ethicalmarkets.tv. And we said investing in saltwater agriculture is the next big thing. 
And of course, here in Florida, we've been dealing with algae blooms. Guess what? Algae, of course, is a halophyte and it grows on salt water, but it can be harvested as a jet fuel. And there's all kinds of other things we use algae for, including food supplements like spirulina. Yep. So all of this ties in perfectly with the, the sustainable development goals, which 195 countries uh, agreed to at a UN conference in New York in 2015. This is the new roadmap way beyond GDP, which was just about looking at the cash flow um, that goes through the economy. Um, and instead, this is a much better new roadmap for going uh, into the future. And it's all totally based on the new Earth system science. And so all of the good news is that 22 countries already eat and grow halophyte pl uh, plants. Um, and many of them, uh, you can find lots more information um, from this, these two uh, references here, Dr. Carl, Drs. Carl and Beth Hodges at the University of Arizona. We've done a lot of work on this, and the Planck Foundation in the Netherlands, and uh, and so basically this is the way nature captures CO2 that we've released into the atmosphere with all of this fossil fuel burning. You don't have to do all this stupid geoengineering and really dangerous proposals that all of these MIT professors and people are putting forward. We don't need to do that. Let's do it the way nature does it. So all of these references um, can be uh, accessed uh, by any of your um, audience. And I like to remind people that we live on an abundant planet. We get so much free solar energy every day. We will never run out of it. And compare that big yellow box, which is the solar free photons that we get every day, with that little um, orange box in the front, which is our current global energy, uh, annual energy consumption. And so uh, we'll be fine uh, for as long as anyone uh, ever thinks about uh, this, I guess, for, for millions of years going forward. And so what I'm very encouraged about is what I've been calling over the years the grassroots globalists. And these are the young people who get together and the environmentalists all over the world, uh, people who are into human rights and feminism and all kinds of local development. And recently uh, they've been joined, of course, by all of the students who are demanding the professors uh, get um, the, uh, the university portfolios um, de-invested from fossil fuels and uh, invest in all of the new uh, green companies that we cover. And now, of course, uh, the children have joined in um, following the young Swedish woman, Greta Thunberg, She's extraordinary, uh, isn't she? So amazing. We have a lovely picture of her going into our next report. And uh, so uh, these children, they, they call it Fridays for Future. And there are millions of children all over the world taking Fridays off from school. And, and they say they'll keep on doing this until the politicians step up to the plate and understand the science and yep. get moving on investing in our future. So this is our Green Transition Scoreboard. And um, it's a free download um, for any of uh, the participants. Uh, we were giving this uh, to a, a group of uh, family office forum people a few years ago. So please uh, invite your audience to go to our website and download it. And we like to remind people this is a very stressful time. We humans are coming up to graduation time on this planet, but we can remember that stress is always evolution's tool, that we all evolve only through stress. 
we wouldn't, nothing would happen if we weren't uh, kicked in the pants a little bit for some reason or other. So this is changing all of our human institutions. It's allowing the new companies to come forward. And we need to remember that economies are living systems embedded in our societies. And all living systems evolve. Uh, the biologists call us punctuated equilibrium, which means that um, these shifts are always done as jumps, evolutionary jumps. It's never a nice straight line. So we're always a little bit surprised, you know. So anyway, when we take that approach, we can take a deep breath and realize that, guess what? The planet and the universe are unfolding just the way they should. So we'll hold on, take our new view, our new scientific view, and uh, go with the flow. And take action. <laughs> so investing in the global green transition to knowledge, richer, scientific economies is where we're going. And we would be doing this even if the fossilized industrial era had not caused all of these problems of climate change and waste. We would be doing this because it's the next stage of human evolution. So thank you. And um, here's all of the resources that you can find free um, at ethicalmarkets.com. In conclusion, is there anything else you think that we should be alert to in terms of trends and opportunities? Because I think that a lot of people that are listening are really committed to creating a better future and looking for pathways to direct their intention and attention and possibly career shifts and, and business opportunities. So. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know, people can take any level um, in their lives uh, to help move this thing forward. We know we have all the technology we need. What we need now is to push our politicians to really accept this. And then we can move our investments. Um, we can go to our pension fund manager of our 401k and say, hey, here's all the companies you should be investing in. Um, we we can join the Meatless Monday campaign, which is another global campaign now, where people are saying, look, OK, um, see if you can do without meat for one day a week. And then uh, we hope the meat eaters will all enjoy um, the impossible foods and all the new burgers, if that's the way they yeah, want to do it. And, yeah. and I'll basically talk up uh, these ideas with your neighbors, your friends, and uh, the small things we can all do which are very important um, change your light bulbs to LEDs um, do water conserving uh, kind of technologies in your own house you know in terms of labor water saving um, you know uh, appliances um, something that uh, we've done here is um, install a, a white roof that reflects uh, the, the sun. If everybody had a white roof, um, it would help enormously. Of course, in Florida, that's really easy to do because this is a traditional Florida roof, kind of updated. It's now aluminum and uh, it keeps the house, uh, uh, this, this house uh, about, um, you know, uh, it saves actually about $100 a month worth of electricity. Uh, that I would normally be using for cooling. And the other thing is that you can go from electric and gas cooking to induction cooking, uh, where there's no combustion, so you don't have to be worried about fire. I moved to induction cooking. You can find it, um, there's, it's just like hot plates. And um, basically, you cook your uh, food on these hot plates, and it's done by vibration. Um, and it, so it doesn't actually get hot. The burner doesn't get hot. The burner doesn't get hot, um, but the food gets hot. Um, it, it's better than microwaving. And that saves me another $100 a month on my electric bill. So um, we don't use our electric cooker anymore. 
So there's all kinds of fun things people can do. You can get your municipality to, to collect and compost your kitchen scraps. Uh, our city uh, of St. Augustine, Florida, has now got um, a plan out there asking um, homeowners if they would like to participate. Now, I already compost my kitchen scraps. Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm. Uh, it's very easy for me to do, um, and it helps grow the beautiful. Uh, I have a beautiful new tree in my backyard, uh, which um, has my favorite kind of melon on it, and yeah. the ki the kitchen scraps uh, really help. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Hazel, thank you so much for being with us. It's wonderful to have had you and to have had the opportunity to connect and, and get to know you. It's been great. Thank you, Mira. I've enjoyed it. Good Wonderful. luck with this. Uh, and uh, good luck to everybody out there. We can do this. So it's all hands on deck now. Yes, it is. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. Keep the momentum going by checking out all the other experts. Every one of them has invaluable information that you can't afford to miss. Buy the Premium Summit Package now. Join the global conversation in our Facebook group and take action in your home, community, or the world at large. Together, we will shape a world that works.